Good morning. Welcome to Memorial Park Baptist Church in Vesto. I am here once again. Pastor Marlene, of course, was visiting her son down in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and because New York State has a quarantine on that state, she is quarantined for two weeks at home uh, as uh, she uh, abides by New York State uh, regulations regarding the pandemic that we're going through. She is available if you have for phone calls. If you call her, uh, you can, if you need to have a pastoral need, feel free to call her and, uh, and be able to uh, have a conversation with her. If there's any pastoral emer emergencies that need a visit or something like that, she can refer that to me and, uh, and so forth. So just uh, keep her in your prayers as she'll be uh, isolated for a couple of weeks uh, to abide by the New York State uh, uh, requirements for quarantine during this time. Let's join our hearts in a moment of prayer and then we'll hear God's word today as we come before the Lord today. Father, we want to thank you so much for this day you've given to us. We thank you that we can worship you and we pray, Lord, that during this time of hearing your word, may your Holy Spirit speak to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, our passage of scripture that we're going to look at is in the 12th chapter of Romans, verses 9 to 21. And I want to just share God's word with you as we study the scripture today. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Do not pretend, do not just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Do not be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let ego, evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Let us pray. God, we pray now that as we hear your word, your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been, of course, looking at uh, this journey that we've been going through, of course, through this time of pandemic and societal unrest. A couple of weeks ago, Alicia talked about the great divide that our nation's facing and the whole racial issue that our nation is going through. And, and she outlined using the story of a, a, a Israel's uh, captivity in Egypt to the, the freeing of the um, Israelites into the wilderness and into the promised land. She talked about their occupation under Rome and talked about the kingdom of God and the impact, the, 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 the impact that the gospel can have in bringing reconciliation to our world today. Last week, I kind of rewound the tape a little bit and I talked about where it all began. How did a nation how did a world become so badly divided? And how did the Holy Spirit bring about reconciliation? How does he want to bring about reconciliation? And of course, we talked last week about the Tower of Babel and how the nations were scattered, their cultures were scattered, their languages were scattered, and there was confusion. And yet on that day of Pentecost, 
the Holy Spirit brought them back together again. Now the question is, is how do we who are followers of Jesus Christ live in the Spirit? And one of the things that I said in closing my message last week was that when we live in the Spirit, our attitude towards other people is that their lives matter more than our own. Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, even though he had equality with God, he had the full rights as the second person of the Trinity. He was God in flesh, yet he emptied himself even to the point of the cross. Our lives mattered more than his own. He was willing to go to the cross for us. He was willing to put our salvation first before his own life. And that's really what God calls us to do in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. But the question for us today, and I want to kind of zero in on this a little bit more, what does that look like in a very practical kind of way? What does that look like more specifically? And I think Romans 12 verses 9 to 21 gives us some, uh, some clues and some keys on how we can live a life that's a life in the spirit where your life, another person's life is more significant or more important than mine, that we must be willing to give up our rights so that others may experience the grace and love of God. What does that look like in a very practical way? Verse 9 in the New Living Translation starts off this way. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. The New International Version of Scripture says, love must be sincere. It all begins that our love for God and our love for others must be sincere. Not pretending to love them, but to really be sincere. Now it's interesting, in the original language of Scripture, which was in the Greek, really that word sincere comes from two Greek words. It means the word not, not, and then the second word was hypocritical. Not hypocritical. The word hypocritical was a Greek word that was used in, in, in the theater in which an actor would play the role of another person. So if you were in a play and you were in a theater production in ancient Greece, you might play the role of another human being in that play. You had a certain role as an actor, but that wasn't the real you. And so here what Paul is talking about is we're not merely to be actors of love, we're not merely to be people who are just playing a role, but that from the, from the life in the Spirit, as we are touched by the Holy Spirit, that our love is real and sincere. That that's what it means to live a life that other people and their lives is more important than ours. That you matter. Your life matters more than mine. Love must be sincere. Now, what does that look like? What does sincere love look like? And he goes on to talk more about this in this very same chapter. And he first of all talks about the fact that love must be a love that is extended to others. In verses 9 to 13. Let me just read 9 to 13 for you once again. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. There are several things here about what it means to have a love that is extended to others. First of all, it's a love that hates what is evil and holds on to what is good. And again, that idea of holding on, and original, again, the original word for that means to be glued. It says there, it says that our love must be, we must be glued to what is good. Now, interestingly enough, I was reading a commentary about this phrase, hate what is evil and hold tight Hold on, be glued to what is good. 
There are people who will fall to one extreme or the other, and that's one of the reasons why often our love is not sincere. First of all, there are those who hate what is evil, and that's what they're all about. They're, they hate evil, they hate all the evil in the world. And yet, it's easy to become judgmental if all you're doing is hating what is evil. But then you have those who hold on to what is good, but they do not hate evil. So they have no problem accommodating sin and accommodating that which is wrong. Now those who hold on to, who hold on to what is, to hate what is evil, they can become very judgmental and self-righteous. Those who hold on to just what is good without looking at what is evil can fall into an attitude of flattery. And the first characteristic of an extended love does both. It hates what is evil, but holds on its glued to what is good. It involves having a kind of love that not only is against certain things that are wrong, but also affirms that which is good. And when we're dealing with people, that's how we need to treat people. That's how we need to treat others. Yes, hold on to what is good about them as well as hate maybe the things that are causing them harm. Have the kind of relationship and love that's willing to take risk and willing to see not only the, the struggles that people have, but also what is good in them and what God is doing in them. That's real love. That's a love that's extended. Another thing the text talks about, it's a love that's courteous. It's a mutual kindness and affection. Verse 10, let me just read that again. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Actually, the original language there again is the word have a brotherly love. It's where we get the phrase Philadelphia. In fact, that's why they call it the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. In other words, Love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a courteous kind of love, a mutual affection and kindness. Verse 11, it goes on to talk about it is a love, not only is it a love that hates what is evil and holds on to what is good, it's not only a mutual affection of Philadelphia, a, a brotherly, brotherly or sisterly love, but also as verse 11 says, it's a love that is available. It does not lack in zeal. It's not sluggish or lazy. It's fervently available. Verse 11 talks about this. It says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Let me tell you one thing about love. Genuine, sincere Christian love. It is hard work sometimes. It's very hard work. I think it's especially hard when we're dealing with people who might be different than us. Maybe they're a different personality than we are. Maybe they come from a different background than we do. Maybe they're a different race than we are. And, you know, we've been brought up in a certain culture and they've been brought up in, a, in another culture. Maybe, they're, maybe their backgrounds are so totally different. Maybe they're in a different economic situation than we are. It takes hard work to love the way Jesus wants us to love. But if we really want to live according to what Jesus talks about and that your life matters more than mine, Realize that to have that kind of love will take some hard work to try to understand and to listen and to hear what people have to say from where they're coming from. Could you imagine if we had that kind of attitude in the church where others mattered so much to us that we were willing to listen to them, willing to kind of take in where they've been and where they are in their walk with Jesus Christ. That's what real love, sincere love, not hypocritical love is like. It involves never lacking in zeal, never lacking in the hard work that it takes to love others. Another thing that this love does, it's also though, it's filled with hope. Not only is it hate, hate what is evil and holds on to what is good, not only is it courteous, not only is it available, but it's filled with hope. Listen to what verse 12 says here. Verse 12 says this, Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. That kind of love is always filled with hope, even when times are tough. Even when it's difficult to love that other person. Even when there is sadness and hardship. To be patient in trouble. That's built on a life and love of hope. 
being involved in trusting God through that situation. Be patient in trouble. That Greek word literally means hyper remaining, to remain with that person to a hyper sense, to more than, more than what we would ordinarily do with people. That word trouble means pressed, to be pressed in. And that word to be pressed in is, was used in uh, stopping and pressing grapes in the agricultural field in the biblical times. And so a, a love of hope, a, a love that is centered in hope, is a love that endures when people are being pressed in, feel like, they feel like they're in a great press, they're being pressed in, and they're going through all kinds of hard times, to patiently walk with them, to be there with them. It is filled with hope. An extended love also, though, is generous. Verse 13. Let me just read 13 for you again. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. When there's a need, an extended love, a sincere love, a love without hypocrisy practices hospitality. And when someone's in need, we are there to support them. No matter what their background is, no matter what their situation is. And Paul talks a lot about that and these various characteristics of what we would call sincere love. Well, that's all fine and dandy. And I'm sure you're saying, well, that's great. That's a good thing to learn and everything. But what about, what about when that love is not reciprocated by others? Because I will tell you one thing. Sometimes when we try to show a sincere love towards people, it's not always reciprocated. In fact, we might be outright offended by how we are treated when we've, we've given all our best efforts to try to love others and it's not reciprocated. How then do we respond? Paul addresses that really in the rest of this chapter and I'll go through this very quickly. Because in verses 14 to 21, let me just read these verses to you again. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Do not be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Do not let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Even when we are offended and love is not reciprocated, we need to still show the sincere, non-hypocritical love that only the Spirit can give us. Now, there's a number of things here I think we can learn from these verses in 14 to 21. First of all, we need to have the right attitude. Bless those who persecute us. Be willing to say and declare God's blessing on people who mistreat us. That is not easy to do, but that's what Christ's love means if he, his love lives within our heart. God is able to forgive sin and God is able to move in people's lives. But one of the ways that we as Christians can show real love, sincere love, is by blessing those who persecute us. Sadly though, many times in the church, and I've seen this too many times, when people do something that is in opposition to the church, immediately we want to strike back. We want to say, well, those terrible people, or we get into a political argument with people because they happen to disagree with our position. Or that we get into all kinds of arguments, and I see it all the time, by the way, on Facebook, where Christians will just argue and argue and argue and argue. As soon as somebody says uh, something critical about them as believers, they immediately want to strike back and, 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 and kind of get revenge. Our attitude needs to start be right, though. Our attitude needs to be willing to bless people even when they criticize us, and even criticize us wrongly, and particularly if they persecute us. The other thing we see here is that we are called to live in harmony with people. 
In fact, I think uh, verse 18 is very interesting. It says, do all you can to live at peace with everyone. Another translation says, as much as it is possible with us, do everything you can to live at peace with other people. You see, we can't control what other people will do. But we can allow the Spirit of God to control how we will respond to that. You see, we can't change people. We can't make them different. But we can't allow God to change us. I will say this is especially true in marriage. I've seen people, they go into marriage thinking, well, maybe they will change if I marry them. Well, guess what? Usually that does not happen. And I have, seen, I have seen in my years of ministry, people have tried to change their spouse. And guess what? Doesn't usually happen. What can change is allowing God to move in our hearts. To allow God to change us. So that we know how to respond instead of cursing them, instead of criticizing them, but to bless them instead. That's what real sincere love involves. That doesn't mean you don't express your opinion. That doesn't mean you don't express how you, how you feel. But understand that ultimately, we need to allow God to work in our hearts. Because others' lives matter more than our own life. That your life matters more than my life. Could you imagine? Could you imagine how much the church could grow and its relationship to people around them if we had this attitude to do all we can to live in harmony. And as, as the text also talks about, really it's an outward act as much as it depends on us to live in harmony. There is one other thing that this text does talk about, and I've kind of been bringing us to this point. A love that is offended, to be sincere, does not take revenge, but leaves it to God. Even those who rub us the wrong way. Verses 19 to 21 says, If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Let God be the judge. Let God do the vengeance part. Our cause to love people. There was a number of years ago that I was with a youth group out in western New York. We went out to our Baptist camp out there, uh, Camp Vic. And after we, we, it was clean up day, we were there to get the camp ready for the summer. We pulled brush and did some uh, cleaning and so forth to get the camp ready. Well, afterwards, we went to a restaurant that uh, we had about 10 of us there, and we had a rest, went to a restaurant that was on the way. And I will have to say that at this restaurant, the service was absolutely horrible. I mean, it was bad. I mean, it took us an hour and a half to be served. The waitress wasn't particularly efficient. Plus, I don't think she liked our kids because they were all teenagers and were pretty noisy. But it was really horrible service. Now, my re first reaction after all this and after taking so long to eat was to give her a lousy tip. I wanted to give her just maybe a, a penny, because it wasn't very good service. But this passage kind of convicted me. I was thinking of this passage. It convicted me, and that's not what Jesus would do. So I gave her a real good tip, and I gave her a note, and I was very honest. I said the service was not the greatest, but nevertheless, the Lord loves you, and I want to give you this tip, just to remind you that you are loved. Now, it took the grace of God to do that, because I'll tell you what, every reaction that I had was, no way do I want to give her a good tip, especially after that horrible service. But I realized that if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, that's how I need to treat it. And let God do the work in her life. And me not to be the judge and jury of why she was not doing the job that I thought she should have been doing. Now, I don't know how that story ever turned out. I don't know whether, whether it ever had any impact on her or not. And yet I think it's just a reminder in a very practical way that when we're dealing with people, when we're dealing with people, not only should we have a love that's extended to others, 
but also that when we are wronged or when we are offended, that we love them anyway with a sincere and not hypocritical love of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. And in this crazy world that we're living in where everybody wants revenge or everybody wants to get their last, last word in and all this arguing back and forth, the great divide in our nation, we as believers need to live the way Jesus would have us live and not merely follow the ways of this world which seeks to get even. That's the call of the gospel for us today and the challenge that I believe that God has for us. I leave you with this one final statement. Remember this one thing, if you remember nothing else that I say today, it's not Jesus and me, it's not I, but Jesus. Let me repeat that. It's not Jesus and me like we're some kind of team here, but it's instead it's not I, but it's Jesus. The more that Jesus lives in me, and the less of me controlling things, the more people will see Jesus in, instead of seeing just me. And when they see Jesus in me loving others, that is the impact that the gospel could have in the lives of people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for what it teaches us. We're challenged once again by, by what Paul has to say here in the 12th chapter of Romans. And we pray, God, it won't just be about Jesus and me and kind of rolling along, but it really would be less of me and more of Jesus. Not I, but Jesus. We're reminded of the words of John the Baptist when he says, he must increase while I decrease. God, help us to love with a non-hypocritical love a love that extends out to others, and a love, that, a love that even when we are wronged and when we are offended, a love that can still uh, declare blessings on people who persecute us. Or instead of seeking revenge where we are willing, we are willing to show kindness and love to them, even in the midst of being mistreated. Lord, help us to do that this week. Help us in our daily dealings with people, even with people who might be of a different background than us, people that we might disagree with. Help us, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.